Welcome back. Today we're looking at the fourth day of creation, which is about the purpose of Christ, Him calling us in to worship Him through holy communion or relationship with Him and His people. We'll see that in some detail today. But as a way of quick, quick review, you remember that on the first day, the Lord saw that the world was formless, void, and dark. No potential for growth, no favor, no fruit in the world, but still, he shows up in his presence, that supernatural light of Christ. And then he separates the waters from above from the waters below. It's a picture of the plain speaking of Christ because he could not bless a world that is formless, fruitless, and has no favor uh, from him, no reason to bless it. But then he begins to act in protecting us from that uh, danger and chaos of sin in the world symbolized by the ocean and he provides for us uh, this symbolism or metaphor of fruit that is the potential in the ground. It, it's only potential at this point because we'll hear later in Genesis 2 that only the Garden of Eden was fully formed bearing fruit and the inference there is that Adam and Eve were to follow Christ into the world, the pre-incarnate Jesus himself to bear fruit in the rest of the world. We'll see that in later videos. And then on the fourth day, he uh, puts this celestial calendar in the sky, the sun, moon, and stars. And the reason we know it's a celestial calendar calling us to worship is because of what God says himself in Genesis 1. Let's take a look. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs for seasons, for days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. Typically, for each of the eight P's of the Gospel, I've broken them up into three separate videos, one on the hermeneutic, one on the hope, and one on the help of that P. The hermeneutic meaning how we know this is what God's Word says, so you don't just think it's Jeff Diller's idea, I want to teach you to read God's Word for yourself. The hope, meaning what difference does this make to believers that we would want to live the life that the Lord God calls us to, and the help, how we're to use this information for the encouragement and the faith and obedience of other people. However, because the purpose of Christ, represented in the fourth day, has seven different aspects all outlined in the book of Leviticus, we're going to take the hermeneutic hope and help and put it in each of these separate seven videos so you don't have 21 videos. hope that makes some sense, and I hope you'll stick with us. The second feast of worship or calling to worship that we see outlined in Leviticus 23 is the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Typically these are celebrated together, although they are two uh, distinct and separate events. And you can see here on the slide that I have an asterisk uh, by this to denote that this is one of the three uh, corporate calls to worship. Uh, of the seven, only three required everybody in Israel to come from wherever they were in the country to come to the, the temple or the tabernacle. Tabernacle when they were in uh, the wilderness wandering the temple and it was built permanently later under Solomon. That everybody was to come. The reason they were all to come is because those three symbolize something that calls them to corporate faith and corporate action. Everybody. The ones that uh, they did not have to all come shows that something Jesus did and doesn't call for any action on their part. Now, in each one of these, I'm implying an action. For example, the Sabbath, rest in me. Uh, but isn't that an inaction? Uh, and others will see it's kind of a passive action. Uh, let's take a look at the scripture that tells us this is all about follow me, follow Christ, symbolized in the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. First we see in Exodus 12 that every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for the household, and then down later in the passage, take some of the blood of that lamb 
and put it on two doorposts of the lentils of the houses. Again, just as a reminder, if you're not familiar with the passage, they were to take that blood and we'd put it on what's called the door jams, the lentils, same type of thing, of the house, to symbolize when the death angel came over that they were to see that the lamb literally uh, covered, the blood of the lamb covered the house, and the death angel would pass over the house. That's why it's called Passover. And they were protected by the blood of the lamb. Look at our next passage of scripture. In John chapter 1, uh, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Here's the first explicit reference to following Jesus, but it's inferred in the Exodus passage because of their obedience. You were to trust in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, follow me from Egypt into the desert toward the promised land, by faith in the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb's death in your place will cover you. Follow me, was the inference in the Exodus passage. Let's look at the next passage of Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 5, uh, Paul says, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. In the Exodus passage, in the John passage, uh, Exodus inferred, John explicit, they were to follow him uh, from Egypt into the uh, desert and the promised land. The disciples were to follow Jesus. Here is a symbolic reference to following him in a life of holiness. That because the Passover lamb, Jesus, has been sacrificed, we are to follow the Lord in a holy lifestyle. In Revelation chapter 5, uh, we read that when the lamb had taken the scroll the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And you can read in the rest of that passage that they declared he, only he is worthy to take up the scroll because he has made his people a kingdom of priests forever and ever. Again, an inference to their submission to the Lamb is the one that they are to obey and to follow. Now, what difference of hope does this make for believers? Well, the first one I've already stated, that this first of three required corporate festivals calls us to a collective faith and action. We are all to follow the Lord. We are to help each other follow the Lord. We speak so much in Western society about individual faith, uh, my personal relationship with God, and he certainly calls us to individual faith and obedience. But he also calls us to corporate faith and obedience. Corporate, core, C-O-R-P-S, is from the Latin meaning body. Corporate meaning body, the body of Christ, of which each of us uh, as believers are a member. We are to help each other follow the Lord. Uh, that means that we are to be encouraging each other, equipping each other by um, calls to remember his commands and promises helping each other when we stumble, building each other up in the faith. Uh, it's not just an individual action. Secondly, we see that Jesus' one-time death effectively rescues his people from our death because of sin. The Lord said on the cross again, it is finished. We do not add to anything Jesus has done. It's not that his death on the cross as our Passover lamb got us there halfway to heaven or 99%. There's nothing we can add. When Jesus said it is finished, that means we have a little more left to do. No. It means it's finished. We can rest because he has perfectly accomplished all of the payment for our sin. Thirdly, he continues to lead us by his power away from death. Following him from uh, Egypt into the wilderness to the pro promised land symbolizes a process. So he has taken all of the legal punishment by his death on the cross, but in another sense, we are still being saved. He's still putting to death uh, in us our sinful desires, uh, de uh, uh, temptations that are still in us. It's a process, and by his Spirit living in us, we are still depending on him and the power of his Spirit to follow him. We don't go on our own strength. He causes His Spirit to live in us 
so that now we are his temple. Uh, not that there's anything wonderful or beautiful or powerful about us, but because he lives in us by his grace and that we trust in him to follow him in obedience. Fourthly, he leads us into the desert to humble us and feed us and prosper us in him. Uh, we see in, in Deuteronomy 8 that he is the one who feeds us. He is the one who takes care of us. Uh, we read there that even the shoes on their feet didn't wear out for 40 years. That he is our strength when we follow him. Uh, he is always our hope. And lastly, he promised past tense and present tense reminds us that the desert is part of the journey. When we leave our Egypt of sin, that slavery, we don't immediately step into the promised land. Uh, he reminds us it's going to be a journey. He tells us where we're going. We can expect hardship, but we can also expect him to take care of us. And so we follow him realistically into a time of him humbling us, softening us, preparing us, strengthening us, not just in ourselves, but strengthening us as we experience his strength depending on him. Now, how are we to take some of those truths and more and be of help to other people, other believers and non-believers? Let's look at a few practical things. One, we remember what our slavery was like and we call them to follow Christ. We should be empathetic with others, not thinking, hey, I've made it. I've made it to the promised land. I'm glorified. I'm perfected. Let me show you how I did it. No. Uh, we remind them that the Lord is the one who changed us. Look back to the time when he changed your spirit immediately. And many things about you were immediately changed. You were humbled so you didn't trust in yourself. You wanted to trust in him. Maybe he immediately took away um, most of your anger or he, or he immediately took away most of your fear. Uh, there was a, a supernatural change in you. And then as you began to follow him, you experienced more of his work in your life. We need to testify about those things that, that are outlined in Psalm 107. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And then four different testimonies about how they were in some type of trouble. And they cried out to the Lord and he did something specific based on their specific problem. Uh, we need to be empathetic with them. Secondly, we need to tell them that he calls us to journey together following Christ, to let them know that they're not going to be alone, that uh, this is a corporate following, that they can depend on us and that we will need to depend on them. Not because there's anything super wise or amazing about us, but because that's how the Lord works. As we help each other, he honors that faithfulness of love and he blesses us and leads us through this wilderness in this world. Uh, to, to grow in our relationship with him and each other. Thirdly, we journey with them and we lean on each other to honor our Lord of love. It's not just about the success of the journey. It's about learning what love is, that we confess our failings to him in the hearing of each other as appropriate, that we, uh, as he weakens us, we see that that is part of love that we need to see our need and goodness of depending on him and depending on each other, that we are quiet sometimes and don't speak, and that we let our brother and sister speak about what they uh, have learned about the Lord, how they have grown, that it's not about us, that we uh, build others up to become even greater than we are so that they can become leaders in the faith and, and move on to uh, build up their family and their community that it's love. It's not just about our reputation. It's not about our personal growth. It is about experiencing and expressing the Lord of love himself. As John the Baptist said, we must become less that he be may become more. We must uh, diminish that he may increase in his reputation. And lastly, to remind each other of our destination, uh, perfect eternal life with Christ that we are following him, yes, into the wilderness of this life, but that's not our destination. That's part of the journey. The destination 
the ultimate rest that we're following him to is perfection in the new earth when he will change all of this into a perfect paradise and that we are following him to that destination. The Lord says, uh, blessed are those who endure to the end for they will receive the crown of life. Uh, so we persevere, uh, not thinking that tomorrow in this life things will be perfect or next week or upon retirement or anything else this world could offer except the Lord Jesus himself in paradise. Hope that's been helpful and hopeful to you too. See you next week when we look at the third different aspect uh, of the purpose of Christ, Holy Communion with Him and His people, and I hope to see you then. At the release date of this video, I am stationed with Research, Development, and Engineering Command, RDECOM, at Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. Because the majority of our personnel are in this area, I spend most of my time here. I do, however, travel to our distant units based on command priorities and budget. I place these videos on YouTube for broad visibility to Army personnel and their families, but I hope the videos will be helpful to others too. If you are assigned to RDECOM and want to request specific topics by video, training on site or by VTC, or confidential counseling on site or by secure webcam, you can contact me at jeffrey.d.dillard.mil at mail.mil.